Thanks for coming out today. My name is Danny. I'm going to talk about recommending beer and how we can work with salespeople to create this iterative process about getting data science out into the product, but actually to be used by our salespeople. And then, um, again, iterate through so we can learn from them. So the main three topics I'm going to talk about today, introduction to the three-tier system in beer, uh, a little background on beer before we get into the data science aspects. The beer industry is a little bit unique based on regulations compared to some other industries. Some forecasting and recommendation approaches that we've taken for how we can get beer out into specific outlets. So each unique type of beer into the right outlet for that beer. And then an iterative process again about working with our sales team to get data science out into the force. So the three tier system, this is specific to the United States specifically and some other countries it's uh, treated a little bit differently. But at least in the US, we have the three tier system where the brewery, so Miller Coors, sells beer to a distributor. The distributor now sells beer to a retailer, and then you as a consumer are purchasing from the retailer. So now we're separated by four levels to our actual consumer who's drinking our products. So it's a little bit unique because other industries don't need to deal with this dis distributor being in the middle. They could sell directly to the consumer. So we can't have an online presence where we're directly selling to our consumers, therefore we don't have that direct uh, customer data. So with that being said, we have uh, this recommendation model that we'll walk through as two different approaches based on the specific um, industry within our industry. So we have an on-premise industry and then off-premise. So an on-premise is gonna be like your bar where you can actually go drink beer on site. As you see on the left-hand side, we've got a couple of our taps over here, Miller Lite and Blue Moon. But from a data science perspective, how can we uh, make sure that those are the correct products that should be sold into that specific outlet? Should we be selling Peroni or another one of our products on tap instead of Blue Moon in this case? Then from an off-premise perspective, an off-premise is gonna be like your grocery store, uh, your 7-Eleven, Walgreens. You go purchase your alcohol and you bring it home to consume. So in this picture, we have uh, some Miller Lite, we have some Coors Banquet, we have some Coors Light, again, should we have other products of ours in this location, or are these the correct products? We use data and, and a recommendation model to make sure we get the correct products out into that specific outlet. All right, before we jump into recommending beer, I wanna walk through a simple example of how a recommendation model works from a movie aspect. We're all familiar with Netflix. This is really where recommendation models took off. So we have three users, John, Tom, and Alice. They've watched four different movies. Sandlot, one of my favorites, Avatar, Titanic, and Star Wars. They've all have given their ratings to the specific movies they've watched. And now we have a new user down on the bottom, Jane. So Jane's watched the Sandlot, Avatar, and Titanic, but Jane has not watched Star Wars before. So if we were to predict what Jane is going to rate Star Wars at a very simple level, we could use something like the Pearson correlation for John, Thomas, and Alice relative to Jane and use the similarity score to predict what Jane would, would rate Star Wars given she watches it. So in this case, if we were to take, say for example, a K equal to two, we take the two closest users to Jane. In this case, that'd be John and Alice. John gave a score of five, Alice gave a score of three, averaged those out, and Jane's score for Star Wars is predicted to be four. If we do K equal to three, in this case, we have three users in our population, so we'll take all of our users. In this case, Jane's predicted score is gonna be 3.3. So now we can do this for all of the movies that Jane has not seen before, do a sort order rank in a decreasing order, and take the highest predicted scores as the recommended movies that Jane will see next time she comes onto Netflix or whatever the streaming uh, service might be in this case. All right, so with movies, movies for the most case, uh, in the most part are not seasonal too much, although there is some type of seasonality with movies. So you have specific movies during the holiday season, maybe some types of movies are only popular in the summer months. But beer specifically is very seasonal. We have a lot of trends in our data. So instead of using historic sales data or ratings, like in this movie example, in our case, we're gonna take forecasted values, and those forecasted values are the ones that are gonna go into our user item matrix. So again, with this movie example, we have our users as our column, John, Tom, and Alice, and then our items here are gonna be our, our uh, movies. 
These are historical ratings. Again, we're going to be forecasting what these ratings or volume of beer should be into this matrix. So just an example of a, of a forecasted graph. It doesn't really matter what product this is. We're forecasting out for the next three months. We're going to take the sum of that forecasted value, and that's going to be the true value for each specific item at a given outlet. So bring that down into a matrix now, similar to the movie example. The top table is just showing an example of a forecasted output for a specific outlet uh, product combination. So we have an example with bar one, item two. We're forecasting out a volume of five. So in this case, I'm just going to use volume. It doesn't really matter what volume is measured in, uh, but we could just say it's a volume of five in this case. Bar one, item four. We're forecasting out that this specific item will sell a volume of four at this bar. Uh, sorry, three, and then bar one, item five, we're forecasting out that this bar will sell a volume of six. So now those forecasted values could get brought down into our user item matrix, and we see that across the board in red. So we've got bar one, item two, we're forecasting out a value of five. So now these are the ratings that a user would give a movie uh, in a Netflix sense. So just at a larger example, uh, just blowing up a little bit, these values represent the forecasted values for each product and outlet combination. Now realistically, there's a lot of outliers. So one particular outlet might sell tons of beer relative to others. So we do some normalizing of this data to bring it down onto a smaller scale. So how are we gonna go about making predictions now? So the approach that we're taking is a collaborative filtering recommendation model. And this example is going to walk through at a real basic level how uh, that collaborative filtering works. The matrix over here that we're looking at now, instead of the true values or the forecast values, these are the predicted values. So how we go about that is creating a number of latent factors associated to each bar uh, uh, item combination. So in this case, I'm using five latent factors. We see um, for bar one, we have five latent factors across. And for item one, we have five latent factors um, associated with that specific item. Each of these embedded factors are picking up information about our sales data. So you notice that I'm not actually inputting characteristics about beer. I'm not saying that the beer is light or a dark beer, it's a fruity beer or a hoppy beer. Only sales data is being input into this model, but the latent features are picking up information about that structured data. So now we can use, at a, at a basic example, the dot product combination to get the predicted value for each outlet and uh, bar, uh, sorry, outlet and item combination. So the dot product output in this case for bar one item two would be to take 0.22 times 0.81 plus 0.79 times 0.68 plus 0.05 times 0.79 plus 0.72 times 0.69 plus 0.22 times 0.08. So that's a dot product between bar one and item two. That output is a predicted value, in this case, of a volume of 1.26. So these uh, factors are initialized at random. If you, remember, if you remember from one of the previous slides, the actual true forecasted value we're saying was a volume of five. So we're predicting a volume of 1.26. The forecasted value was five, pretty bad prediction. But that's okay, because these, these, these factors were just initialized at random. The collaborative filtering now is going to find the optimized features, uh, latent factors, for this specific bar item combination in order to minimize down at the bottom our root mean squared error. So over time, this is an iterative model. It's going to be learning, and continuously that predicted value will get closer and closer to 5 in this case. So these are now our predicted uh, volumes relative to the actuals. Before I'm moving on real quickly, I just want to put in a shout out for Fast AI. So a lot of what I just explained is taught really well from a website Fast AI. It's taught by Jeremy Howard. He's got a, a MOOC online, Mass Open online course. He does a really great job at explaining not only these uh, specific concepts, but a lot of other uh, sophisticated data science concepts as well. All right, so interpreting the results. So if we go back to one of the um, matrices, we have these five latent factors associated to each bar and to each item. I mentioned earlier that we're not actually inputting characteristics about beer. So again, we're not inputting that it's a light beer or a or dark beer, a fruity beer, a hoppy beer. These latent factors are picking out information about the sales data based on the relationships of the data. 
And how we can actually interpret that now is to look at one specific embedding. So realistically, you might use 40, 50, even 60 embeddings. In this example, I just used five embeddings. And we're going to interpret one of those embeddings here. So over on the left-hand side, we have the top products based on embedding one. So embedding one is just going to be um, the first embedding associated to, in this case, bar one and item one. And the top embeddings are picking up information about things like Coors Light bottles, Miller Light bottles, Miller Light, Miller High Life. So you can see over on the left-hand side, this embedding is picking up some information about light beer, specifically maybe bottles. If we take the reverse, if we look at the bottom products based on embedding one, we see a lot of fruitier products. So we see Red's Pineapple, we've got Henry's Strawberry, Henry's Lemon, Henry's uh, Passion Fruit, um, Red's Pineapple. So on the reverse side, this latent feature is not picking up information about fruity beer, but it is picking up information about light beer. So that's a way that we can interpret more of a black box model by taking these embeddings and actually analyzing them to see what the embedding looks like, uh, almost more in an unsupervised fashion. So now if we were to plot this out, so again, realistically, you might use 50 or 60 embeddings. You can't go through each one of those embeddings trying to figure out what that specific embedding um, entails. That would take a lot of time. So one way we could do, one way we can analyze all these embeddings is through a principal component analysis. So we're going to take those 50 or 60 embeddings, bring them down to maybe five principal components, and analyze now those five principal components instead of all 50. So this graph over here shows a two-dimensional view of, our, of just two specific principal components. And we can see down here on the bottom right, we've got light beer. So we've got Coors Light and Miller Light. And then up in the middle section on the top, we've got those fruity beers. So we have Red Apple, Red's Blueberry, um, Henry's Orange, and Henry's Grape. So something about these principal components are picking up features about light beer as well as features about fruity beer. We don't know specifically what they're entailing, but we can interpret the results of our embeddings to come up with this conclusion about uh, the meaning of the data in this sense. So going back to some of the other earlier talks too, talking about more sophisticated models, more black box approaches, you're gonna lose some interpretability. This is one way that we can interpret our model, or do you go with more of a, a lightweight model, a decision tree, it's really good in that sense to go out to the business, sales people, marketing people, it's, it's a rule-based model, so it's very easy to explain in that sense. All right, so now we've built our model. We've taken our data science. Uh, we're working with a product owner in this sense. We're putting our data science into a product, but how do we get it into the, sale, into the hands of our salespeople? In order to do this, we have uh, an example of a dashboard on the left-hand side. So we're taking our, our results now. Our output is a predicted item, so we're taking the top three predicted items at a specific retailer. So we've got John Doe's sales dashboard. John Doe's going out to Joe's Pub and Grill. He's going out to La Mesa. And he's going out to the corner bar. So our recommendation might, uh, might predict that uh, John Doe should be trying to sell in Miller Lite kegs, Coors Light kegs, Miller High Life cans. It's one thing to just give recommendations, but we also want to create a story with our data for our salesperson to use on how or why these products should be sold into that outlet. So using some other data sources, we'd use uh, unsupervised learning, some clustering algorithms to give a story or a sentence, Miller Lite kegs should be sold into your outlet because of reasons X, Y, and Z. This gives more of a personable uh, persona to why those products should be sold into the outlet. In the next example, we have uh, La Mesa. We could assume maybe this is a restaurant, uh, Mexican restaurant, and the top three recommendations are sole keg, Coors Banquet, and then Peroni. So for those unfamiliar with our products, Peroni is an Italian import, and in this case, we're recommending it into a Mexican bar, Mexican restaurant. So it's very likely that some of our recommendations might not be the best fit for that specific recommendation, and that's where this iterative process of getting feedback from the salespeople is really important. So we start with the data science, we're working in this case with a product owner. The product owner might be the intermediary between the data science and the salespeople. Our output gets into the hands of the salespeople. Again, we need to get feedback now, so this loop needs to occur. And now we get the 
now we reiterate next time so we don't recommend Peroni into the uh, Mexican restaurant in this case. And the salespeople don't even need to know that they're interacting with us based on how the feedback is being populated into the dashboard. So now next time that John Doe goes out to La Mesa bar or restaurant, he's not recommending Peroni, he's recommending maybe Coors Light because that was a better fit for that specific outlet. So one of the reasons or feedback might have been Peroni is not the right product or maybe the manager is not a fan of Peroni. So we need to use that feedback again to iterate and make our, our recommendations and our models smarter over time. Um, so that's all I have, thanks. Thanks. A um, couple sources you can find me online or uh, a lot of blogging, sports analytics if you're interested. So thanks very much. Hey, thank you for the talk. Does advertising complicate your world? How and how do you deal with that? Sorry, could you repeat that? Advertising probably affects people's preferences and you know heavily polluting your landscape for clients, right? So it must be changing all your recommendations somehow. If you don't advertise versus when you advertise something heavily, it must be factored in your models somehow. So how do you do that, if Adver you do that? Advertising, you're saying? Yeah, um, one of the big areas that we need to focus on specifically, not just Miller Coors, all the big alcohol companies, innovation is huge. So they're constantly pumping out new products. So definitely uh, marketing spend is something that we've taken into account. We're thinking about how we can maybe utilize that. Um, but also for new innovative products, how do we make sure that those new products get recommended out into the specific outlets? If we launch a new product just using our existing model, we're never gonna recommend our new product. So we definitely need to take that into account. Um, what are some of the factors that you use to um, analyze whether or not a particular retailer or location, aside from just the beer options? Because you mentioned like if a manager wasn't a fan, but are you looking at things like um, the region and? Yeah, seasonality or uh, region is definitely important too. So theoretically, the collaborative filtering should pick up on some of that information. So. What I had shown fruity beers and light beers, one of those latent factors hopefully would pick up that this is more of a West Coast beer or East Coast beer, um, but it's definitely something that we need to make sure of that we're not recommending a beer only sold in California to states on the East Coast in that sense. Hi, uh, my name is Evis Singh. I'm from Discover Financial Services. Um, my question is, if I understand correctly, you are using the iterative feedback to update the model that's actually making the prediction that's going into the, collabor the collaborative filtering matrix. Uh, if, that is if that understanding is correct, uh, could you like explain um, on a higher level how exactly you're incorporating that feedback into the next iteration? Yeah, so this still is somewhat a work in progress in that sense. Um, we wanna stay away from creating too many rules. So in the case with Peroni, um, we need to make sure that the next time we run the model for that specific outlet, Peroni is not recommended based on the feedback. But there's also the, again, we wanna stay away from just creating a rule-based model where it's all based on feedback from our salespeople. Just because somebody says Peroni at that time, it was not the right product, doesn't mean in the future it can't be the right product. Um, so it's kind of finding that balance between what our recommendation model says versus what the sales person is saying in that sense. So I don't have a good answer for you right now, but uh, work in progress. Uh, first off, I'm jealous of your job. The second question is, um, wouldn't there be self-selection bias if you, let's say, predict Miller Lite or whatever that is, first and second uh, uh, beer, but you keep getting back the same information as part of the feedback? How are you aware of what are the other preferences which is not observed? Uh, yeah, yeah. so how do we make sure we're not only recommending Miller Lite and Coors Light, I think, is the question. Yeah. Um, so in that case, taking the outputs of our recommendation model along with the unsupervised approach we have, so we use some other data sets as well to kind of find a fit of what the uh, portfolio of a specific outlet looks like, and we match that unsupervised output with our predictions. So if, say, for example, uh, 
a bar is a nightclub. You can all get an idea of the types of people at a nightclub, but we're recommending Miller Lite and Coors Light. That might not be a good fit based on what the unsupervised learning is telling us. So we try to marry those two together. Great presentation, very interesting application of the recommendation system. So I got uh, two questions. Uh, one question is that how do you measure the impact brought by the algorithm? Say, for example, there are many, considering other factors that place into the sales results, for example, um, holiday factor or seasonal factor, or for example, you said like there's some judgmental uh, change you want to bring into different nightclubs, different kind of bars. So how do you measure the impact uh, considering there are many complicated factors? And my second question is, um, yeah, how do you measure, say, there are different bars and normally how much of the judgment you like capture when there's a recommended, um, recommended type, different types of beer and how much percent of the, say, human judgment, salespeople judgment you play uh, into this system? Um, so first question, yeah, really good question. How do we measure the output of how well our model is doing? So we're still pretty in the early stages of, of putting this out into a production state. It's difficult when you're working with salespeople, you can't really do A-B testing as well. So real, theoretically, if you were had a website or a mobile app, A-B testing would, the, would be the way to go. We have a lot more users. It'd be easy to run an A-B test. It's a little bit more difficult in this case. Um, one possible option maybe is to have a salesperson go sell what the salesperson thinks are the best products and compare that to another bar where we give the salesperson recommendations and compare those, but you're not really gonna get a great sample size in that case. Uh, another way would just be to see if we get an increased sales revenue. Um, but it, yeah, it's definitely a tricky thing to prove how our model is better in this case when dealing with humans uh, from a sales perspective. And then your second question, the new products are, we need to push those up to the top. At a very simple level, you could think like Netflix comes out with their own content. They're gonna automatically bump it up to the top and make sure you see their content when you go onto Netflix. So there's not a model per se that said this content should be shown at the top. They're just gonna automatically bump it up. In our case, kind of coming back to one of those earlier questions, if we have a new product, one of our newer products is Cape Line, the company is really pushing for Cape Line, perhaps we just need to use an unsupervised approach to find which outlets are appropriate for Cape Line and automatically bump it up to the top in that case. The uh, Peroni example I find really interesting. So uh, one of the struggles I've had, and I'm always looking for guidance on this, is how do I get buy-in? So you figure out the problem, you solve the problem it's in an ideal world. Um, but the salesperson says, well, no, this is a Mexican bar. We're not gonna sell an Italian beer. Well, we can paint the whole house with that. Well, this is an Italian bar. We're not going to sell a Mexican beer. This is a Irish bar. We're not going to sell an American beer and so on and so forth. So how do you, how do you kind of get over that, that hurdle? Yeah, so we plan in the future to go out with some of our salespeople. The last speaker was talking about talking to some people in the airline industry and actually speaking with uh, customers. So I, I don't have a great answer right now, but in the next month or so, I do plan to go out with our salespeople and see how are they using our recommendations? Are they using them? Are they interpreting it one way or another? And how do we make sure we get the right information into their hands to utilize uh, the, the dashboard the best it can be in that case? In terms of the team that is working on this, it seems like you have some design questions, some maybe programming and interface questions, and some data science questions all going on at the same time. How are you thinking about the composition of who should be working on this and how they're working within the organization? So we have a good cohesiveness between the product owner and the sales um, and the data science. So we're talking about Agile in one of the earlier uh, talks. We run in an Agile way. Stand-up meetings, everyone communicating really well together. One of the other speakers was talking about failure. People need to be open to failure and that we might have a two-week sprint and not make improvements because of a failure, but it's going to route us in a different direction to make things better overall. So just the open communication, I think, is really important in that case. So let's uh, break for lunch. I want to say as a special thank you, we have a Domino Data Lab bottle opener. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. you. As a gift. <laughs> uh, if, if you are a